They say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. The giant killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. The popes and the agents of the Holy See have known about the giants for many centuries. And do you believe that they have artifacts from the past that would help explain some of what's going on? Absolutely sure. The Vatican knows all the secrets. preparing for the arrival of alien saviors. They seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine. So while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about Mount Graham. They are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way. I would like to tell you more about Zechariah Sitchin. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. Back in 2005, I was actually stationed or deployed to Qatar. It was a completely normal mission for us. We were not alerted for anything abnormal. It was in the middle of the day. Uh, I remember uh, coming into a base in Afghanistan called Bagram. Back in those days, it was pretty austere. It was an old Russian air base that we were using. Um, it's basically built in a bowl in the mountains where you have to stay high right up in the last minute and then you basically come screaming back down to, to land. Uh, the area to the side of it was called the Valley of Death because during uh, the Soviet days with the uh, Mujahideen they had fired their rockets into a lot of the uh, helicopters so you could see all kinds of uh, wrecks and stuff in the valley below. Which for the most part I didn't pay attention to because I was a little busy getting the airplane on the ground safely. Uh, we landed and uh, basically was told to taxi to the very end of the tarmac. And, and like I said, it was middle of the day, very hot. I remember that. We opened the doors and unloaded the equipment that we had brought in. Uh, and then we were met at the aircraft by uh, what we later on called the babysitters. But uh, they kind of introduced themselves and said, hey, no cameras, uh, nobody's taking pictures here. We're uh, moving some high value stuff. Uh, when the load got there, uh, we're very, of course, uh, curious to see what it was, because that's just the way you are when you're told that you're not allowed to have uh, a camera. Uh, they say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two, uh, but it stunk. And when I say stunk, I've smelled dead things before, but this had a more of a, I want to say a musky stink, kind of a, not really a decay decay, but more of a, if somebody hadn't taken a shower in like 10 years type of a musty, uh, musky stink is all I can tell you. And it was basically a dead guy. And this guy was extremely large. And when I say large, 
uh, our pallets are basically, if I remember correctly, about nine by 12 feet or so. This guy was laying in a fetal position on the pallet. Uh, so he, and he filled the pallet. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. Uh, I did see his skin color. I was expecting somebody of more Arabic descent, uh, being in Afghanistan and all. I know he was dead, but he was very pale, very white. Another thing that uh, us and the rest of the crew did was we took our feet. We, he was in a fetal position, so you could take your feet and put it, kind of, you could see where his feet were there, and they were, they were wrapped up. He did not have shoes on, but he had like, uh, Looked like he was wrapping them in some kind of a canvas type stuff, but we were sticking our feet up next to his feet, and his feet were extremely big. We know that the, the standard weight on one of those pallets is uh, about 1,500 pounds, and I do remember that the loadmaster did the weights, and it was around 1,100 pound guy. The pallet sits on dunnage. You know what dunnage is? It, it's uh, basically like railroad ties so that you can get a forklift underneath it and pick it up. So it was on dunnage, and basic dunnage is like maybe a four by four. And then the pallet is, say, yay thick. It's actually aluminum and balsa wood. And uh, this guy, I mean, laying down was very, very wide. I mean, and he was, like I said, he's in a fetal position. And you go up and just, you hit it. And of course he's under a tarp and all that, I understand that, but he was one dense, he was a dense guy. Uh, we questioned the babysitters of, hey, where'd you get this guy? And uh, some of the army guys that were with him uh, relayed to us that uh, this guy had, I guess, been living up in the mountains uh, next to a village where the villagers basically treated him like a god. I did infer that they were uh, making sacrifices to this guy because they said he was, they found bones of people. The giant supposedly, like I said, I was not there, supposedly killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. They sent up another team, and when the second team went in there to get him, supposedly he had already started to basically eat on the team that, uh, that had been killed the first time. They then grabbed a helicopter, and the helicopter brought him down where we picked him up. After we loaded the Giant, it was just a standard uh, standard mission back. We took him all the way back to uh, El Yudin, Qatar, where he was transloaded onto a, another airplane. I believe it was a C-17. Uh, I was done with my mission then. I got away from it. I was done. I did ask some questions later of, you know, where it might have gone. And as the grapevine goes, it was probably taken back to the United States. And the words I heard were right pat. But again, I don't know. The greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. It's really simple. Those who control the past determine the future. Secret knowledge is the most precious commodity on earth. It's the currency of the occult and the Luciferian elite. Knowledge is power. That's not just a popular expression, it's a fact. Especially knowledge pertaining to the watchers, their hybrid offspring, and their lost technology. We have discovered that when following the trail of the cover-up relating to the world before the flood of Noah, all roads lead to Rome. The Vatican knows all the secrets.
Where does the seat of ultimate temporal and spiritual power reside? Many believe it is here, in Rome, and specifically in the Vatican. Although Vatican City occupies an incredibly minuscule piece of real estate, just over 100 acres, it is an entirely independent, sovereign country, complete with its own police force, military contingent, media conglomerate, central bank, ministry of foreign affairs, and intelligence agency. Covertly referred to as the entity, the Vatican's infamous intelligence apparatus is widely considered to be the most informed, most penetrated, and most insidious network of espionage in the world. The entity, like a spider, perches atop an incredibly subtle intelligence gathering web comprised of priestly confessors, holy orders, secret societies, and informants of all stripes stealthily embedded into every echelon of society. This complex and pervasive nexus collects information from all corners of the earth, even from the most remote locations, and feeds it to the entity at the Vatican. There may be more secrets concealed in the vaults and archives beneath St. Peter's Basilica than in any of the confidential dossiers of every other nation combined. The Holy See has been in the business of intelligence gathering for a very long time. For over a thousand years, the Church of Rome has been expanding its global reach through military conquest, religious subjugation, and political intrigue, acquiring along the way a vast repository of priceless manuscripts and remarkable artifacts from the dateless past. If knowledge is power, then the Vatican reigns supreme. So what does the Holy See know about giants? Are the bones of giants harbored within the secret passageways and catacombs under the Vatican? We have reason to believe that they are, or at least were, at one time. The popes and the agents of the Holy See have known about the giants for many centuries. In the last episode in this documentary series, we presented historical evidence proving that the bones of giants were recovered in Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia by the Spanish conquistadors and Catholic priests during the conquest and conversion of the Incan Empire in the 15th and 16th centuries. Now, we're not just talking about some random fragments of bones that could have been mistaken for mastodons or giant sloths. Full skeletons and bodies of giants measuring well over 15 feet tall were discovered all over the land. The Inca knew about the giants in fact, they believed that the massive megaliths found throughout their empire were built by a race of ancient giants before they were destroyed in a great flood. They venerated the hills and the mounds of the countryside because their legends told that the bones of giants could still be found buried within them. And the legends of the Inca were more than myth. On one occasion, the Spaniards discovered that the natives had enshrined the mummified bodies of giants in a cave and were worshipping them as gods. The chroniclers of Peru recorded that the bodies and bones of giants were incinerated by the priests of the Holy See as they labored to extirpate idolatry among the natives. But the records also indicate that not all of the bones were destroyed. Many of them were confiscated and fell into the hands of the Spanish Inquisition. In other words, into the hands of the Church of Rome. What most people don't realize about the Roman Catholic Church is how intensely involved it is in both the reconnaissance and recovery of arcane relics relating to the true narrative of prehistory. 
So while the rest of the world is being distracted with the convenient fantasy of Darwinism and the evolution of the species, the Vatican is quietly gathering evidence that tells a very different story. For centuries, the agents of the Holy See, especially the Jesuits, have been occupying strategic archaeological locations and seizing critical artifacts all over the earth. Oftentimes, Catholic cathedrals, churches and monasteries are built right on top of the foundations of ancient pagan temples and secret subterranean caverns or passageways. I was informed years ago by multiple individuals within the intelligence community that when dealing with the antediluvian ruins, what's apparent on the surface is not nearly as significant as what's hidden underground. If a Catholic church is built on top of an ancient temple or some important archaeological site, then the priest can excavate undercover and extract whatever artifacts or bones might be buried there without the general public having any knowledge of their activity. Nowhere is this kind of subterfuge better illustrated than in Cusco, Peru. Cusco was the capital and center of the Tahuantinsuyo, the four regions of the vast Inca Empire, which extended from what is today Colombia all the way down the Pacific coast to Chile and Argentina. Much like Rome, Cusco was both the political and religious power axis of the empire. According to legend, it was renowned founder of the Inca Empire, Manco Capac, who led his people through the sacred valley to establish the city of Cusco. The Inca called that land the home of the gods, and for good reason. Although historians almost unanimously attribute these immense megalithic constructions to the Inca, the Inca themselves admitted to having no memory or record of their building. When Cusco finally fell to Francisco Pizarro and his conquistadors in 1537, the temples of the Inca were razed to the ground and Catholic cathedrals were erected in their place, right on top of their ruins. The heathen had been slain and the pagan empire of the Inca conquered by the pious soldiers of the church. It didn't take long for the gilded throne of the Inca king to be transformed into a holy seat of papal power. Priests, nuns, and agents of the Inquisition established their convents in Cusco and began a terrifying campaign to convert the natives still living in the region. The Dominicans were especially influential in the city and built their convent of Santo Domingo right over the ruins of the most important and magnificent Inca palace called Curicancha, the Temple of the Sun. Like many ancient cultures around the world, the Inca built their temples and palaces on top of pre-existing foundations left over from the age before the flood. These were considered to be sacred sites imbued with spiritual energy where the gods of the old world could still be contacted. When the Dominicans built their convent of Santo Domingo over the ruins of the Coricancha, they were taking possession of something far more mysterious and arcane than anything to do with the Inca. So that's where the golden disc was located, right there on that wall. The temple walls within the Coricancho were constructed with the same mortalist precision that is the trademark of pre-flood Cyclopean masons all over the world. In the Coricancho you also have the, no cement, no the, seamless, the seamless stones here, no mortar.
The architectural style suggests that the same antediluvian race that built the megalithic constructions at Tiwanaku in Bolivia were also the original builders of these temple walls. Inside of these walls there are uh, grampas. Grampas is a staples of clubs in bronze made. We are uh, going to see some examples of these stone pieces found in 1960s. Are there blocks from Tiwanaku here in the temple? Yes, the, the Tiwanakus arrived to Cusco in order to found it, uh, in order to build this temple in a, in a Tiwanaku style, in a, like a Tiwanaku people. Now this uh, architecture belongs to the Tiwanaku. This is where they had copper, they had copper fittings here. This is a uh, one example. This, this this is the Tiwanaku architecture. This one too. Huh? This, this is Tiwanaku. Group shapes. This is the club. This club is a Tiwanaku device. Uh -huh. this, is, this is the famous stone where they drilled it. Danny, check this out. This is this is a famous stone here in in Makori Cancha, where it appears to have been machine drilled. The megalithic ruins within the convent of Santo Domingo display the universal signatures of a technologically superior race that was annihilated long ago in the waters of the Great Flood. However, unbeknownst to the thousands of tourists visiting the Coricancha every year, the most amazing works of these ancient master builders are not in view of the masses, but hidden beneath the church. There is an ancient legend that tells of a secret subterranean world connected by an enormous network of tunnels extending for hundreds of miles beneath the Andes Mountains and the Amazon jungle in South America. The nerve center where all these tunnels converge is said to be located underneath the city of Cusco in Peru, the very place known as the navel of the world. The natives called this underground labyrinth beneath Cusco the Shinkana, which is a Quechuan word meaning the place where one gets lost. And for good reason, because few of those who have entered into it have ever come out. The Shinkana is comprised of naturally occurring deep subterranean caverns that are joined together by large artificially constructed tunnels, which are supported in some places by trapezoidal megalithic stone walls and ceilings, just like the doorways in the Temple of the Sun. The Shinkana is essentially a subterranean highway that united many of the most significant antediluvian cities throughout South America with Cusco, and specifically with the megalithic fortress of Sacsayhuaman. We're talking about manufactured tunnels with cyclopean megalithic walls in some segments running for hundreds of miles under the earth. We know, for example, that the natives told the Spaniards that Cusco was connected with Tiwanaku in Bolivia via the Shinkana, which is a distance of over 300 miles. In a sense, the Shinkana is the antediluvian equivalent of what we call today dumbs, deep underground military bases. What's important to understand about this ancient subterranean highway is how massive of an undertaking it would have been to accurately chart and construct it. And we're not just talking about a single tunnel. This is a complex maze of interconnecting passageways and deep caverns, which according to legend were filled with all kinds of deadly snares and misdirections so that only its builders could navigate it successfully. 
The Shinkana represents an ancient engineering achievement rivaling, if not surpassing, any other megalithic construction on the surface of the Earth. There is simply no way that a Bronze Age civilization such as the Inca could have constructed it. Now, they certainly made good use of it, but they didn't build it. By the time the Spanish conquistadors reached the shores of Peru, the Incan kings had accumulated a vast hoard of gold in Cusco from the four corners of their empire. Much of that gold was used to adorn their temples with sacred artifacts and idols. The most lavish temple of all was the Corticancha, whose name means golden enclosure because its inner walls were covered in sheets of gold. As the Spaniards were approaching Cusco, the greatest treasures of the Inca were carried down into the Shinkana through a secret passageway beneath the Corticancha, the entrance to which was sealed up and hidden for generations until it was discovered by the agents of Rome. After Pizarro's conquistadors had thoroughly sacked and plundered the city of Cusco, the Coricancha was ceded to the Church of Rome's Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, and the convent of Santo Domingo was eventually erected over the ruins of its antediluvian foundations. Much to their displeasure, the Spaniards never found the legendary hoard of Incan treasure hidden in the Shinkana and had unknowingly relinquished into the hands of the Dominicans the secret passageway to reach it. The passageways into the depths of the underground world beneath Cusco were controlled by the Inca elite and were kept secret from the masses on pain of death. The specific segment of the Shinkana through which the most valuable artifacts from the temples were carried away before the sacking of the city was a mile-long corridor connecting the Coricancha, now the convent of Santo Domingo, to the fortress of Sacsayhuaman. It was in the caverns below Sacsayhuaman that the treasure is said to have been deposited. There were only two known entrances into this tunnel. One was located somewhere in the vicinity of Sacsayhuaman, and the other was in the Coricancha, presently beneath the church. We know that the Dominicans discovered the entrance to the Shinkana when they built their convent over the ruins of the Coricancha in 1663. And we know that they deliberately kept it a secret. The question is, what have the agents of Rome been plundering from those tunnels all these years? It is critical to comprehend what the Shinkana represents. The sheer scope and magnitude of it implies a level of technology and engineering capability in the prehistoric past that was not supposed to exist until after the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Just like the evidence for giants all over the Earth, the existence of the subterranean highway beneath the Andes in South America has been written off as a fairy tale, even though the historical record is replete with mentions of it. If the Shinkana really exists, then the evolutionary notion that the apex of intelligent life on Earth at the dawn of mankind were apish Neanderthals is utterly shattered. As much as the archaeological establishment would like to pretend that it's only an old wives' tale, the existence of the Shinkana has been proven to be a true legend. In 1982, Spanish researcher and explorer Anselm P. Rambla was taken down into a secret crypt beneath the church of Santo Domingo by the head prior of the time. What he discovered in that crypt would not only confirm that the legend of the Shinkana was true, but that the Dominicans had known about it for centuries. What Anselm P. Rambla saw beneath the Church of the Dominicans in 1982 substantiates my own conjectures regarding the true origins of the megaliths in Peru, Bolivia, and elsewhere in South America. It also validates the idea 
that the Holy See has enjoyed special access to hidden knowledge and artifacts relating to the pre-flood world for a very long time. We suspected that the findings of Anselm's investigation in Cusco would dovetail with our own, so we decided to contact him. Anselm, tell me how your investigation into the Shinkana began. What did you see beneath the convent of Santo Domingo in Cusco? Empezó todo en el 1982 en Cusco, que hacíamos una expedición por todo el Perú, y cuando llegamos a Cusco, aquella mañana estábamos filmando en Saxamamán, y yo decidí con un miembro del equipo ir a ver al prior del convento de Santo Domingo. Dijimos, vamos al Coricancha, al convento de Santo Domingo, y vamos a hablar con el prior si podemos, y hablamos a ver qué, de qué se trata esa leyenda, qué visos de realidad tiene, etcétera, etcétera, ¿no? Y bueno, y nosotros no esperábamos que, que pasaría lo que después pasó aquella mañana. Eh, llegamos ahí, a, preguntamos por el prior, lo, lo entrevistamos, eh, nos atendió muy bien, y hablamos de la chincana. Y en el momento aquel, dice, sí, sí, esto es cierto, y si ustedes quisieran ver una zona de la iglesia, podemos hacer una investigación esta mañana. O sea, quedamos sorprendidos. Y entramos en un sector de la iglesia en donde estaba, había un altar que lo retiramos, un altar de madera movible, lo, lo retiramos. El suelo era de madera y había una trampilla en donde daba acceso a, a unas escaleras. ¿no? La trampilla nos costó abrirla, pero la abrimos con el prior, mi compañero y yo. Entramos y entramos dentro de una cripta una cripta totalmente conservada, del siglo XVII, y en aquel momento eh, analizamos la cripta y vimos un refundido, como una especie de entrada a la izquierda de la cripta, en donde hacía un pequeño hall, y ahí había una pared de ladrillo rojo que estaba totalmente tapiada, un ladrillo puesto, puesto por los dominicos, un ladrillo de obra sencillo. Había unas piedras sueltas y ahí sacamos esas piedras y íbamos con una linterna, pero nosotros no llevábamos en ese momento cámaras ni nada porque estábamos con todo el equipo filmando en Saxaoamán y no habíamos previsto eh, esa entrevista con el prior, no, no, no pensábamos que, que no sucedería esto. En aquel momento sacamos el, los ladrillos, enfocamos detrás de la, de la pared esta y vimos la famosa chincana mencionada por, uh, por todas las crónicas y tal. Yo personalmente, con mis ojos, pude observar la chincana y es el túnel que une el Coricancha, el antiguo Coricancha, el antiguo templo del Sol de los Incas con Saxaomán. En el momento que enfocábamos eh, el túnel, miré paredes, miré techo, miré suelo y el tipo de piedra de construcción era exactamente igual que los templos de arriba del Coricancha. Igual, el mismo corte, tipo de andesita, etc. Muy bien, muy bien pulidos. O sea, un, un corte muy, muy bien pulido por ser un túnel. Y en aquel momento, la luz de la linterna se nos perdía dentro del túnel. O sea, era larguísimo, porque claro, estaba negro, negro, no había nada de, de reflexión, y en cambio la luz se nos perdía al fondo, al fondo, con una pequeña bruma. O sea, digamos que no pudimos ver y, eh, el fondo. Después, eh, yo le digo al, al padre, al prior, eh, déjenos derribar el muro, venimos esa tarde con todo mi equipo, derribamos el muro y entramos con las cámaras y filmamos. Y en aquel momento él se negó rotundamente. Dije, mira, no, sé, sé cómo se asustó. No pens Yo pensé que realmente continuaríamos con esto, pero en realidad eh, cambió su tónica, cambió su, su expresión. Dijo, no, 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 no voy a permitir que, que ustedes entren acá, ya hemos visto suficiente. Eh, en ese sentido, bueno, pues no pudimos hacer nada más. Eh, él nos confirmó que eso es la chincana, que los, do, de los dominicos tenían conocimiento de ella desde hacía muchos años, que se había transmitido ese secreto de prior en prior. En aquel tiempo, o sea, digamos, no, no hicimos nada, ni unos ni otros hicimos nada. Yo tampoco conceptuaba la importancia de la chincana ni, ni conceptuaba lo que nos había enseñado el prior. O sea, no tenía... Eh, perspectiva aún de lo que realmente había pasado. Al cabo de un, un tiempo de unos años, 
comprendí que, que, bueno, que el tema era muy serio y me propuse hacer una investigación y obtener los permisos del gobierno y de la iglesia para hacer una investigación arqueológica eh, detallada y con precisión. ¿no? In 1999, 17 years after his incredible experience beneath the church, Anselm P. Rambla returned to Cusco with a team of professional investigators to begin an unprecedented excavation inside of the convent of Santo Domingo, seeking entry into the Shinkana through the mysterious crypt he had entered so many years earlier. Anselm managed to obtain permission for the excavation from the head prior of the convent, Father Gamara, who signed an agreement on behalf of the Dominican Order in Cusco, along with representatives of Peru's National Institute of Culture. Father Gamara even allowed Anselm and his team to photograph for the first time the crowns of the Virgin and the Child, which are Catholic relics forged by the Dominicans from some of the gold from the legendary Incan treasure hoard hidden beneath Sacsayhuaman in the Shinkana. Anselm's team scanned the floor of the convent and church with ground-penetrating radar and discovered several colonial-era crypts that had been constructed by the Dominicans throughout the centuries. The team excavated and explored these crypts, but none of them opened to the Shinkana. Finally, Anselm located what he believed to be the crypt he had entered in 1982. But to his surprise, the trap door had been covered over with tiles and the crypt itself was now completely filled in with radar blocking debris. Claro, vimos muchos elementos debajo del Coricancha, pero en realidad donde nosotros estábamos apuntando era en la iglesia, donde estaba la entrada de la Shinkana. Pero la iglesia, cuando hicimos el análisis del GPR, del GPR, nos encontramos con un caos dentro de ese subsuelo, difícil de, 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 de analizar y poner las cosas en orden, ¿no? Pero la sorpresa más grande fue que donde yo había entrado en el 82, con el prior de lo que te he explicado antes, en que perfectamente pudimos encontrar la cripta y entrar tan fácilmente, aquella cripta había desaparecido, o sea, el, el lugar de entrada no existía. Es más, el suelo lo habían cambiado, había mosaico. It's obvious that the crypt leading to the entrance of the Shinkana beneath the church had been deliberately filled in with debris and covered over with tiles, and that the Dominicans had no intention of letting Anselm reopen it. In fact, when he proposed to do just that, the church officials abruptly terminated the project altogether. Pero en esa clausura de obras, nosotros nos dimos cuenta de un tema muy serio porque sí que hicimos análisis con el GPR y nos dimos cuenta de que el suelo donde nosotros habíamos entrado en el 82 había sido totalmente alterado. No sabemos la época. Yo pienso que es desde la época del 86 al 88, donde ellos mismos alteraron todo el subsuelo de la zona que entramos en el 82. The superiors of the Dominican order were not happy with Father Gamara for having approved Anselm's project to find and explore the entrance to the Shinkana beneath the church. After signing the agreement, Father Gamara was stripped of his title as head prior of the Dominican order in Cusco and basically banished to some small insignificant priory in another town. A los 30 días de iniciar los trabajos, el Padre Gamara, sin más explicación, no lo vimos más. Y aparece el padre eh, eh, Héctor Herrera, que lo trajeron del norte, y bueno, y se me presenta a mí y me dice, el padre Gamarra ya no está acá y eh, soy el nuevo prior, cualquier cosa tiene que hablar usted hablar conmigo, con, el, con, el, con las obras y tal, porque no estamos en plenas obras. Cuando nosotros terminamos las obras que los dominicos nos votaron, nos, nos echaron del Coricancha, o sea, cerraron, clausuraron con el gobierno del Perú las obras, al cabo de una semana, no un mes, al cabo de una semana, el padre Gamarra lo llamaron de Arequipa y lo volvieron a poner de prior. A ver cómo te lo explicas tú eso. There are of course practical reasons why the Dominicans would want to keep the entrance of the Shinkana hidden under their church a secret. We know, for example, that they were concerned about their property being expropriated by the Peruvian government if the truth were to be revealed. But what we're highlighting here is not just a cover-up by one particular order within the Catholic Church. Indeed, the Jesuits also knew about the Shinkana and very likely had access to it as evidenced in their own cathedral in Cusco, which, just like the convent of Santo Domingo, 
was constructed right over the ruins of an important Incan temple and is still adorned to this day with Incan gold. The priests of these churches may have had even noble reasons for keeping secret the subterranean world beneath the city. Nevertheless, whatever the reason may be, the overarching conspiracy is indisputable. The Holy See has known about the existence of the Shinkana for centuries, and yet has deliberately chosen to keep it hidden from the masses, and by doing so, has knowingly perpetuated the falsehood that it is a myth. El padre Gamarra tenía, tenía conocimientos de la Shinkana, no sabía él bien bien dónde está ubicada, pero sí tenía la información de los antiguos priores de la existencia de la Shinkana y todo su contexto. O sea, siempre él fue partidario de que la Shinkana se tenía que abrir. Eventually, Anselm P. Rambla and his team were able to scientifically confirm the existence of a tunnel beneath the church located precisely in the vicinity of the crypt that he had entered in 1982. But instead of being applauded for their historic discovery, the national press vilified them, claiming that they were treasure hunters and impostors who were putting the structural integrity of the church in jeopardy. As a result, the compelling implications of the Shinkana were quietly swept under the rug, literally covered over and covered up. Shinkana exists. There are staggering implications inherent in that fact. The rational mind is forced to conclude that we have a substantial gap in our knowledge of the past, like an intricate jigsaw puzzle with some of the most essential pieces missing. Someone is holding those missing pieces, and I believe has been quietly assembling them behind the very convenient facade of conventional archaeology blinded as it is by the deceptive doctrines of Darwinism and the evolution of species. The question is, to what end? The clues for putting all the pieces together are hidden within the pages of scripture, as well as in other ancient texts and oral traditions. Solomon said that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Everything that has been hidden is now being revealed to those who are willing to search for the answers. The answers to the enigmas of prehistory are there, right in front of our eyes. But we have to be willing to relinquish our preconceived notions about the past and free our minds from the fetters of academic propaganda. We know that the watchers descended to the earth in the age before the flood. Those fallen angels who kept not their first estate and are bound in chains of darkness as plainly stated in the book of Jude and second Peter. We know that these watchers taught mankind forbidden knowledge and corrupted the genetics of life on earth, even producing their own hybrid offspring with the daughters of men, the mighty giants of old, as well as many other genetic monsters conceived through their perverted acts of rebellion. These perverted beings, these watchers as they are called in the ancient texts, not only copulated with human women, but also with beasts, with animals. So you can imagine the genetic mess of unsanctioned sentient entities inhabiting the planet before God put a stop to it all, literally washing the slate clean in the waters of the flood. The age before the flood of Noah was a time of extreme wickedness on the earth. 
a time of bloodlust, paganism, and sexual perversion, unparalleled in all of history. Mankind betrayed his creator and followed in the rebellion of the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, the fallen angels. The chaos wrought by the Watchers persisted for over a thousand years after their descent in the days of Jared until the flood of Noah, as reckoned in the Greek Septuagint. That's an incredible amount of time for the distribution and propagation of hereditary genes. That is to say, a thousand years of mutations in the DNA of not only the human race, but many other species besides. The supernatural seed of the fallen watchers was like a virus that ultimately infected everything. Imagine the global empire of fallen angels and their hybrid offspring, the demigods of legend, giants, centaurs, satyrs, minotaurs, and a host of other genetic monsters roaming the planet and leading humanity in open rebellion against God for hundreds of years. This is what the ancients called the Golden Age, the time when the gods descended to commingle with men. Like Prometheus stealing fire from the gods, the Watchers brought down forbidden knowledge from heaven, knowledge that defiled the mind of man and hastened the destruction of the world. The cataclysmic flood of Noah utterly annihilated the old world. It swept away its inhabitants and swept clean the artifacts of their civilization, their knowledge and their technology. The only remaining vestiges of that age of corruption, the so-called golden age, are the megaliths. The term megalith refers to prehistoric edifices constructed with immensely large stones. The ruined foundations of these megaliths, still standing like fleshless bones after thousands of years of inundation and weathering, bear witness to the builder gods of the pre-flood world, their hybrid offspring and their celestial knowledge. There exists a vast network of megaliths all over the planet, some of which are well known like Baalbek in Lebanon and Stonehenge in England while many others, such as the Bosnian Pyramid and the recently discovered megaliths in Siberia, have not even been officially acknowledged as artificial structures yet because their unfathomable size absolutely demolishes the conventional paradigms of anthropology. Not only are there megalithic ruins dispersed over every continent on the surface of the Earth, many megalithic structures, like the Shinkana, are buried under the ground and sunken beneath the oceans. This is a worldwide phenomenon that is much more widespread and significant than anyone even realizes. One of the most impressive and important megalithic sites in the world is located just outside the city of Cusco. The Inca called it Sacsayhuaman. The first thing that you need to know about Sacsayhuaman before formulating any conjectures concerning its construction or its builders is that what you are seeing is literally only the tip of the iceberg. When Anselm and his expeditionary team excavated at Sacsayhuaman, they discovered that more levels of these cyclopean walls were still buried beneath the sediment of the mountain, a testament to the fury and force of the Great Flood. The fact is that only 10 to 15 percent of this enormous megalithic complex has been unearthed, and what remains above ground today is much less than what was present centuries ago before the Spaniards dynamited and dismantled the higher segments of the walls for the construction of their own villas and cathedrals in the city of Cusco.
Beach Mammoth Block incorporated in the walls of Sacsayhuaman is precisely and uniquely fitted with the one surrounding it without the use of mortar. Some of these polygonal blocks weigh over 300 tons and stand over 20 feet tall. The quarry from which they are believed to have been extracted is over 20 miles away. Inca legend records that the walls of Sacsayhuaman were built by giants. The first Spaniards to lay eyes on these walls also believed that they could not have been built with human hands and that they must have been the work of enchantment or demons. If there was ever an example of an ancient construction that appears to have been built by giants, it's here in Sacsayhuaman. These massive stones have been fit so perfectly together that you can't even slip a piece of paper between them. This is incredible masonry beyond the capability of mere human beings, in my opinion. The official narrative concerning the walls of Sacsayhuaman is that the Inca constructed them using ropes, ramps, and soft metal chisels, employing many thousands of workers for many decades, which is not only ridiculous, but also impossible for numerous reasons. During the course of his excavations, Anselm P. Rambla uncovered proof that earlier civilizations had occupied Sacsayhuaman long before the rise of the Incan Empire. Although the Inca did not build the walls of Sacsayhuaman or any of the megaliths found throughout their empire, they did make use of them. Fortifications and towers devised by Incan masons were raised right on top of impregnable pre-flood foundations. The workmanship of the Inca sticks out like a sore thumb and represents a level of technology consistent with the Bronze Age civilization. The mighty Cyclopean walls of Sacsayhuaman don't stand alone in Cusco. At one time, the entire city was a megalithic metropolis. The city of Cusco itself bears witness to the superior technology that once existed in the distant past. Many of the buildings lining its streets and back alleys have been built on top of ancient megalithic foundations. Since its fall to the conquistadors in the 16th century, numerous devastating earthquakes have rocked the city of Cusco. In every case, the walls of the cathedrals and villas built by the Spaniards came crumbling down. But the pre-flood Cyclopean walls stood fast. Megaliths aren't just big. They're geometrically precise, intentionally and ingeniously devised to withstand extreme seismic activity. This is a kind of master masonry from the prehistoric past, far surpassing anything we can build with stone today. The difference between the two walls here in this one street in Cusco is astounding. This is the original construction. If you look straight down it, you'll see that it's, it's straight. It's very well constructed and it's leaning in a little bit and they built these walls like this so that they could withstand earthquakes. This is the Spanish side of the wall where the Spaniards took apart the blocks and, and re, reconstructed them here and you can see that they used a lot of concrete. And if you look down this wall, you see that it is very poorly constructed in comparison to the original wall, very wavy, and uh, you get the sense that this thing would come crashing down in the event of a large earthquake. The Cyclopean walls found throughout the region of Cusco are primarily comprised of hard andesite, basalt, and granite blocks, which have a distinguishing convex or pillowed surface to them with beveled joints, as if they were soft and malleable like clay when they were set into place and then pressed together. There is reason to believe that the antediluvians may have been able to somehow change the chemical composition or even the atomic structure of hard stone in order to make it softer and more pliable and possibly lighter. This may sound unbelievable, but it is consistent with what is observed in the streets of Cusco. It appears that these two large boulders have been set on top of this rock here while this rock was not entirely hard. In other words, this rock would have been soft and these heavy rocks would have been placed on top of it 
and it would have they would have literally squished down into this rock on the bottom and that is exactly what appears to have happened here. Aside from these stones having the appearance of being pressed together, raised ridge lines can be seen on their outer parameters when adjacent stones are removed. This is yet another indication that these blocks may not have been carved, but set into place like lumps of clay where they molded into one another as they hardened. It is apparent to anyone willing to think outside of the very limited parameters of conventional archaeology that the Cyclopean walls in Cusco represent in themselves a lost age of profound scientific knowledge and advanced technology. It is also apparent that neither the Inca nor any of the cultures they conquered were in possession of that knowledge. What is often overlooked is evidence indicating how suddenly devastation befell the builders of the megaliths. This is best illustrated in the place where the Inca won their greatest victory over the Spanish, Ollantaytambo. Ollantaytambo is located about 40 miles outside of the city of Cusco and was built up as a defensive position by the Inca against the invading Spaniards. The constructions at Ollantaytambo represent a fusion of pre-flood cyclopean masonry with inferior Bronze Age level masonry and demonstrates an attempt by the Inca to copy the cyclopean style. But the stark contrast between the two is glaring. Ollantaytambo has some of the most well-preserved and masterful cyclopean masonry I've ever seen. Some of the curved corners in the walls are sculpted from single blocks and joined together with flawless precision. Just like at Sacsayhuaman and in the streets of Cusco, these walls were built at an inclination to withstand earthquakes. One of the amazing things about the engineering of these gigantic walls is that they were built on an inclination this is a very advanced engineering, apart from the fact that these blocks are absolutely immense. Ojantai Tambo is the key for decoding the origin and sudden disappearance of the megalith builders in the Altiplano. Combined in this one location are two distinct cyclopean architectural styles the polygonal convex blocks of the Cusco region and the rectangular interlocking vitrified blocks of Tiwanaku. These two styles together suggest that they are related and have nothing to do with the Inca. Located at the summit of the construction are some of the largest standing Tiwanaku style blocks ever discovered. megalithic stones here that make up part of the wall at the Temple of the Sun in Ojantai Tambo. One of the interesting things that we notice having come from Tiwanaku is that we have these patterns that were being carved into these rocks into the face of this wall that are basically originate in Tiwanaku and this is exactly what we're told by the guides that whoever built this wall was either the same culture of the of the people who built in Tiwanaku or they copied their their form of construction. We're told that these the smaller stones in between the, the large ones here were placed um, so that this structure would resist earthquakes, that when this structure began to shake it would crush the smaller stones rather than the big stones cracking and falling. Um, so it's pretty ingenious construction they had up here. Each one of these rocks weighs, each one of these stones weighs somewhere between 70 and 100 tons each and were quarried from the side of the mountain way up high in the mountains up there and somehow were brought and placed to where they are now. These gigantic blocks were cut out of the bedrock near the peak of the mountain at very high elevations and then carried down the mountain, over the river, across the valley and up the dirt ramps that are still present to this day before being set into place without a scratch on them. 
This was, in every sense of the word, a superhuman feat. What is undeniable about Ojantai Tambo is that whoever the builders of the Megalis were, they suddenly disappeared before finishing the project. Large blocks of stone were left lying on the ground as if dropped in panic and confusion. It is claimed that this abrupt cessation in construction was due to the invasion of the conquistadors. But it is far more likely that the invading force was not the Spanish, but the waters of the Great Flood. This behind me is called the military zone up here in Ojante Tambo because this is where the Incas built their stronghold to resist the conquistadores that were, that were moving in on them. Um, our theory about this place is that the Incas found a construction here that was extremely advanced, and so they decided to build on top of it or add to it. Uh, they probably thought it was a holy place. They certainly revered whoever the mythical builders were of this place. Uh, in their eyes, perhaps giants or gods that built these uh, immense constructions. And uh, as you can see, there's a huge difference between the, the massive, intricate stonework um, that we found in, in Pumapunku and uh, what we see here at the Temple of the Sun and what the Incans built in haste here behind me to fortify themselves against the Spanish. Ojante Tambo is perhaps the best illustration on earth of how post-flood cultures attempted to copy and emulate the works of the gods who lived in the age of corruption before the flood. As fascinating and far-reaching as its implications are, Cusco is but a microcosm of a much larger reality existent on a global scale pertaining not only to the phenomenon of the megaliths and the sudden disappearance of their builders, but also to the special knowledge that the Holy See harbors concerning them. In order to verify this reality, we had to travel to another hemisphere where the same dynamics of those present in Cusco could be observed. Somewhere a little closer to the axis of papal power. the island of Malta. Located in the Mediterranean roughly 50 miles south of Sicily and 200 miles north of Tripoli, the island of Malta is one of the world's smallest and most densely populated countries. Though the landmass of the island measures just over 120 square miles, its vistas are rich with variety and history. Malta's strategic location in the Mediterranean has made it an important asset to a succession of powers throughout history. But it was the Knights Hospitaller, otherwise known as the Knights of St. John, that left the most enduring mark on the societal development, art, and architecture of the island. Over the centuries, Malta has accommodated a diverse array of governing powers. The Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, Moors, Normans, Sicilians, Spanish, the Knights of St. John, and most recently, the French and the British, have all ruled the island for a period of time during the course of its colorful history. As a result, modern Malta is an eclectic blend of ethnic and cultural heritages. But the identity of the earliest inhabitants of the island is shrouded in mystery. Because just like the megalith builders of Cusco, they seemingly disappeared overnight without a trace. Although located in two different hemispheres, Cusco and Malta are surprisingly similar in a few very intriguing ways. First, the Church of Rome has a prominent and long-standing presence in both. 
Second, there is a hidden network of ancient underground structures and tunnels in both. And third, both are home to large cyclopean megaliths. The megaliths in Malta are said to be the oldest free-standing structures on Earth. Some of these structures were built to the same scale as the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Cusco and displayed many of the same engineering techniques. But because they were constructed with limestone, which is considerably softer than granite and andesite, they are much more eroded. Close proximity to the sea has also exposed the stones to a constant blast of corrosive salty air for thousands of years. What's fascinating is that in the mid 16th century, while the Spaniards were looking on the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Peru for the first time and walking through the ruins of Tiwanaku in Bolivia, the first excavations of the megaliths on Malta were beginning and the very same conclusions were being drawn by the explorers in both hemispheres. These were all structures built by an extinct race of antediluvian giants, which is exactly what the ancients have been telling us for thousands of years. The ancients believed that the megaliths found on the islands of Malta were built by a race of giants. In fact, here at the Gigantia temples on the island of Gozo, close to the mainland island of Malta, there's this UNESCO sign that says the name Chicantia derives from the word Chicant, Maltese for giant. As Gozatins used to believe, the temples were built by a race of giants. We're in the interpretation center at Chicantia and Goza, where you have a number of legends from all over the world displayed here, including Stonehenge, which the ancients thought was built by Merlin, but not alone. He had help from giants to shift those uh, huge blocks of stone. Here in Goza, Chicantia, which comes from the word giant, the place of giants, was actually built this time not by a man or Merlin, but by a woman who uh, had a child and would carry the child along with her on her jobs carrying huge blocks of stone. Incidentally, her name was Samsuna, which is probably a reference to the biblical Samson, Samsun and Maltese. So we even know her name. The ancients often encrypted secret knowledge in the form of myths that were easily remembered and passed down from one generation to the next. Gigantia was obviously not built by a single giant woman, but the details of the story provide clues to the true identity and nature of the builders. The most obvious clue is her name, Samson, which indicates supernatural strength. What's important to note about the megalithic blocks used in the construction of these sites here in Malta is that many of them are fragmented. They're, they're fragmented now, but you have to imagine these blocks as solid pieces at one time. These were solid blocks of limestone, and you can see where they're fragmented and where they've chipped off. Those aren't separate blocks. These were solid one-piece blocks that were used as the material for building in these structures. Looking at this, this temple complex, I'm reminded of the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Peru, which are very, very similar to this structure here, to what we see in this structure here. If this were not limestone, if this were andesite, or this were a harder stone, they would probably be very smooth and fit together so tightly that you couldn't pass a blade between them, just like we see in Peru. And what that suggests is something that conventional historians and archeologists can't accept that there was once a common global race, very likely of giants, that were building megaliths all over the earth in a very similar fashion.
as in every case around the world. After the megalith builders disappeared from Malta, consecutive cultures of lesser technological skill occupied the vacant edifices they left behind and attempted to repair them using smaller stones usually held together with mortar. Archaeologists often ignore this obvious fact and credit the primitive latecomers with the building of the impressive structures they merely inhabited and refurbished. Aside from the monumental task of cutting, carrying, and lifting the massive stones into place, these ancient master builders were also assembling them into circular dome configurations, which requires an extremely high degree of mathematical precision and is much more difficult to accomplish than building traditional square or rectangular structures. It is important to note that in the age before the flood of Noah, the Mediterranean may not have existed as an inland sea. And therefore, what we presently know as Mediterranean islands, such as Malta, may very well have been the most elevated regions of the once dry land that is now immersed in the waters of the Atlantic. In light of this plausible contingency, we should not view the megaliths on the island of Malta as an isolated phenomenon. It is very likely that many more of these cyclopean structures were once present all throughout the Mediterranean basin before it was flooded. Furthermore, because of the presence of these megaliths, according to our research, we should expect to find an extensive network of subterranean complexes connected by what might be designated as the Northern Hemisphere's version of the Shinkana. Just like in the Altiplano and everywhere else on Earth where megaliths are present, what's above the ground is not nearly as impressive as what's below it, and Malta is no exception. It is well known that there is a vast maze of tunnels, caverns, and catacombs burrowed deep into the limestone bedrock beneath the island. In fact, during World War II, as the Axis forces were unleashing one of the most brutal and prolonged bombing campaigns in history, many of these tunnels and caverns were used by the Maltese people and allied forces for shelter and for the storage of munitions and other vital supplies. Numerous legends have surfaced over the years concerning strange entities, including giants, inhabiting the hollows of the subterranean world, especially relating to Malta's most famous ancient underground complex, the Hypogeum. We're getting ready to go into the Hypogeum, which is a very famous underground tunnel system, more than a tunnel system, it's underground chambers that represent what's on the surface here in Malta, the megaliths that are on the surface, the same sort of chambers and, and megalithic architecture was carved out of the limestone in the ground. So this is the entrance to the Hypogeum. It's just basically under the street, underneath the buildings. The Hypogeum is a multi-level underground complex that was carved entirely out of solid rock. It was discovered by accident in 1902, when workers digging a well broke through its upper level. The Trilithon doorways and dome-like chambers of the complex mirror the Cyclopean architecture of the megaliths on the surface and demonstrate a highly advanced level of engineering skill. It is estimated that over 2,000 tons of stone was removed to create its subterranean chambers. The most famous of these chambers is known as the Oracle Room because of its unique acoustic properties. Any sound generated in the Oracle Room is carried throughout the entire complex and vibrates through the walls. At one time, a large megalithic structure stood directly above the entrance to the Hypogeum. It is believed that even more of these underground complexes may exist beneath the other megaliths on the island. Access into the Hypogeum is very restricted. 
You're not allowed to carry anything in with you, and you're certainly not allowed to film or take pictures. Even the historical narrative is carefully controlled. Before you can descend into the complex, you have to view a video presentation which asserts, rather ridiculously, that a group of primitive Stone Age farmers, using only obsidian chisels and deer antlers, were the builders of the hypogeum. When finally I descended into the complex, I was immediately struck with how haunting the atmosphere was. Apart from the natural darkness, there is a palpable metaphysical darkness lingering in the atmosphere down there. It's not at all like a cave or a tunnel. It's much more like a crypt, a place of esoteric power. When its chambers were first opened in 1903, the bones of 7,000 human beings were discovered inside the hypogeum. Among the bones were some very unusual skeletons, at least six of which had strangely shaped elongated skulls. All of the bones were eventually removed from the hypogeum and placed in storage, and the six elongated skulls were put on public display in a museum in Malta's capital of Valletta until 1985 when they mysteriously disappeared along with many of the other bones. Elongated skulls have been discovered all over the earth. Many of these peculiar skulls are not just abnormally shaped, they are anatomically different than ordinary human skulls. The official policy concerning them is that every single one, and there are thousands, is merely the result of artificial cranial deformation, such as cradle headboarding and binding, which is still common among diverse indigenous groups around the world. Whereas artificial cranial deformation is definitely capable of molding the cranium into conical forms, it does not add additional mass to the skull. It only reshapes it. However, many of the most pronounced elongated skulls are much larger and heavier than ordinary human skulls and possess more cranial capacity, which in layman's terms means more brains. These phenotypic distinctions are very likely the expression of genetic deviation. In other words, these skulls may have belonged to a divergent human-like species. The implications of such a staggering proposition are astronomical and frankly dangerous to the Darwinian establishment which rejects any proposition that challenges their codified doctrine. However, it is a fact that newborn babies as well as fetuses possessing elongated skulls have been discovered and documented on various occasions, which signifies that a genetic component is involved in at least some of these specimens. The elongated skull phenomenon is not a new discovery. Archaeologists have known about it for centuries. They have known, for example, that in ancient Egypt, the elongation of the skull was a mark of royalty and prestige, and even accentuated in the depictions of the royal line, such as in the case of King Akhenaten, and even more so in the depictions of his daughters. It is possible that the tiaras, headdresses, and crowns of not only Egyptian royalty, but many other ruling factions besides, may in fact be implying an intentional imitation of some venerated hybrid race. It is logical in my mind to conclude that all of these many diverse and unacquainted cultures around the world were artificially elongating their skulls as an act of veneration to emulate the gods or the offspring of the gods, the hybrid bloodline, so to speak. The Bible plainly tells us that non-human hybrid entities exist in the world even after the flood of Noah. Aside from the giants, the Rephaim that we encounter on numerous occasions throughout the scripture, strange human-animal hybrid creatures also appear, such as the lion-like men of Moab mentioned in the book of 2 Samuel. These hybrids were genetically alien to the human race. And I believe that some of them still lurk in remote places of the earth, including the underground labyrinth beneath Malta.
Sightings of both giant and pygmy creatures have been reported in the tunnels and caverns under the island. And more than a few people have gone missing while exploring them, including a class of students along with their teachers. In August of 1940, National Geographic magazine featured an article entitled Wanderers a Wheel in Malta. The article detailed the underground world that honeycombed the bedrock of the island and states that the government had to close the entrances to the tunnels after school children and their teachers became lost in the labyrinth while on a study tour and never returned. Years ago, one could walk underground from one end of Malta to the other, but all entrances were closed by the government because of tragedy. On a sightseeing trip comparable to a nature study tour in our own schools, a number of elementary school children and their teachers descended into the tunneled maze and did not return. For weeks, mothers declared that they had heard wailing and screaming from underground, but numerous excavations and searching parties brought no trace of the lost souls. After three weeks, they were finally given up for dead. We can only guess what happened to these children and their teachers, but I know from military sources that very evil and frightening entities are still routinely encountered under the earth. And as one general informed me, his special operations teams go down into the bowels of the earth to kill the things that go bump in the night. The similarities between Malta and Cusco are extraordinary. The megaliths, the secret subterranean world, missing artifacts, and at the center of it all, the Church of Rome. It is well known that Jesuit priests, along with other church clergy and affiliates, were the primary excavators of the megaliths on the island, including the hypogeum. It is also well known that not all of their discoveries were made public. At least one of the cathedrals in Malta was intentionally raised over the foundations of an important megalithic construction, which is rumored to have another hypogeum-like complex buried beneath it. We're in Shokia, one of the larger villages of Gozo, with the parish church right behind me. Well, around 100 years ago, there was a Jesuit priest excavating. Uh, his name was Manuel Magri. He was one of our foremost amateur archaeologists, but he was doing the job on scientific lines. He excavated the hypogeum in Malta. He did Shokia Temple as well. We still have the report in the uh, museum's department. And uh, Shokia Temple has now disappeared. You cannot see it. The church that you see behind me, the Catholic parish church of the village, is built over the site of Shokia Neolithic Temple, which is now all completely gone. The Catholic Church often built its churches on top of previous pagan temples or other religious structures, or on ley lines. In this case, Shokia's parish church, finished in the 1950s, is actually built on top. It has smothered and removed any evidence of uh, Shokia temple. Just like in Cusco, the Church of Rome has intentionally occupied strategic archaeological sites in Malta and has had special access to both the megalithic ruins on the surface of the island and the subterranean labyrinth beneath it for centuries. There is no question in my mind that more underground complexes like the hypogeum exist but are hidden from the eyes of the public. Who knows what sort of artifacts have been removed from these mysterious chambers and secreted away to the Vatican vaults under St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. One thing is for certain, the operatives of the Holy See who have access to those vaults know full well that Stone Age farmers did not build the megaliths on Malta or anywhere else in the world. So who built the megaliths? This is the elusive question that vexes everyone. Even some of the university trained archaeologists with whom I've spoken admit privately that Stone Age and Bronze Age civilizations simply were not in possession of the knowledge or the tools to construct these Cyclopean edifices and not only construct them but perfectly align them with specific constellations of stars based on precise astrological calibrations. It is clear that whoever built them 
had an advanced comprehension of the cosmos. It is also clear that at some point in the distant past, the knowledge of Cyclopean megalithic masonry abruptly disappeared from the Earth. This is a resounding indication that something catastrophic obliterated the old world. Knowledge such as this, so profitable to mankind, is not simply discarded or forgotten. Surely the superior and universal building technique that not only withstands extreme seismic convulsions, but also survives the tempests of time, would have been worthy of preservation and further developed by consecutive civilizations. The question of who exactly built the megaliths is much less relevant than the question of when they were built. And it is our contention that they belonged to that empire of the gods, which was decimated in the waters of the Great Flood. So in other words, they were constructed during a time when not only giants walked the earth, but a host of other hybrid sentient entities, all utilizing the forbidden knowledge of the Watchers. Malta holds many more mysteries than we had time to thoroughly explore. The famous cart ruts engraved into the bedrock all over the island are an enigma in themselves and could provide proof of prehistoric machine technology that may have been used in the transportation of large stones. We know that many of the megaliths were once covered beneath the layers of sediment. We can only wonder how many more are still buried under the soils of the landscape or sunken under the waters of the Mediterranean. The island of Malta has provided us with another piece of the puzzle concerning the true legends of our forbidden prehistoric past. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Hebrews, the Indians, the Chinese, Japanese, and Tibetans, the Greeks, the Romans, the Inca, Aztec, and Maya, as well as hundreds of other cultures besides, all record in song verse, sacred script, and oral tradition, a time long ago when the gods descended from heaven to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race until a great cataclysm destroyed their world. Many of these ancient records also prophesy a time when the gods will return to resurrect their empire and reinsert themselves into the human genome. Vatican now only uses the advanced telescope for one purpose, one, he said, and that is to monitor exo-worlds on which they believe the conditions exist for extraterrestrial life. Now that might have been a real tell about what it is they're watching on the top of that mountain that they think might be approaching the earth, as Malachi Martin said. I'm often asked, why does any of this matter? Why should we care about these watchers that descended from heaven or about giants in a pre-flood world? The answer is simple, because it's all going to happen again before the end of the age. The golden age of the gods is going to be resurrected. This is the end game for the Luciferian elite, their golden dawn. A great deception is brewing. You have to be grounded in the truth in order to withstand the storm that's coming. How you react to this deception is going to hinge on your understanding of the gospel and the world before the flood of Noah. We are about to enter into a time 
that has been anticipated by the adepts of the mystery schools for thousands of years. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race, just as they did in the age before the flood. The procession of history is going full circle back to the beginning, and the Vatican is leading the parade. What most people don't realize is that the Church of Rome is a continuation of the Babylonian mystery religion that began in the plains of Shinar. It is destined to open the gates of the gods and usher in a new golden age led by the lawless one, the reincarnation of Nimrod. The hierarchy of the Church of Rome is a continuation of the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian priesthood. The fish head miters worn by the highest ranking officials of the church represent a Mesopotamian hybrid demigod known as Uwana Adapa to the Sumerians, Oannes to the Greeks, and Dagon to the Hebrews. According to legend, Oannes was a hybrid fishman who emerged out of the sea to reinstruct mankind in the lost arts of science, technology, and civilization that the gods had revealed to men before their empire was destroyed in the cataclysm of the flood. Since the conception of the Roman Catholic institution in the fourth century, under the direction of Emperor Constantine, the Church of Rome has become the epicenter of occult power on earth, hijacking the gospel of Jesus Christ and masquerading as his bride, thus making herself the mother of all harlots. Rome has always been the seat of the Pontifex Maximus, beginning with the imperial Caesars until the crown and scepter were inherited by the popes. Pontifex Maximus literally means greatest bridge builder, which is a fitting title for the pagan high priest, the mediator between the gods and mortal men. Although the temporal power of the popes has waxed and waned over the centuries, the spiritual power of the high priest of Babylon has only burgeoned behind a counterfeit facade of Christianity. In many ways, the Pontifex Maximus is the continued embodiment of Nimrod and the Roman Catholic Church, the perpetuation of mystery Babylon. It is no wonder then that the Church of Rome should be interested in the forbidden knowledge of the fallen entities that inhabited the world in the age before the flood, since it was Nimrod who resurrected the worship of the hosts of heaven and rekindled their rebellion in the hearts of men. Controlling such knowledge has always been the prerogative of the Luciferian elite. Since its inception, the Church of Rome has been conquering, controlling, and co-opting the pagan mystery cults around the world. In the city of Rome, some of the most iconic Catholic monuments are marked by obelisks taken from the pagan temples of Egypt. On a practical level, this was done to flaunt the dominance and preeminence of the Catholic Church over all other religions. But on an esoteric level, it was a sign that the pagan mysteries were being assimilated under one supreme authority, the Holy See. Illustrating this fact is a pantheon, once the greatest temple of the ancient Romans, dedicated to all their pagan gods. Now it is a basilica of the Catholic Church, converted by Pope Boniface IV and consecrated to Saint Mary and the Martyrs. In other words, the pantheistic religion of Rome was co-opted by the popes, and the pagan gods of the Romans were merely replaced by the saints and martyrs of the Holy Roman Church. At the end of the day, it's the same idolatrous religion with new names and faces. The Roman Pantheon is a great example of how the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, co-ops the pagan religions of the cultures that they conquered and they inherited the pagan religion uh, of the of the Roman Empire and what was once the Roman pantheon with the various deities Roman deities is now a basilica that belongs to the Vatican the obelisk represents the phallus of the Egyptian deity Osiris 
Osiris himself is symbolic of the Watchers who descended from heaven and taught mankind forbidden knowledge. In myth, Osiris was killed by another god and his body was torn into 14 pieces which were scattered all over the earth. In order to resurrect Osiris from the dead, his dismembered body had to be reassembled. Eventually, 13 of the 14 pieces were recovered by his wife, the goddess Isis, but the 14th piece, the phallus, was never found, so Isis fashioned an artificial golden phallus to replace it. After assembling the 13 pieces together with the golden phallus, Isis raised Osiris from the dead. The great work of the mystery schools is to recover the lost knowledge of the gods and resurrect their empire, the golden age, the phallus of Osiris, the obelisk, is a sign of defiance against the Lord and allegiance to the fallen angels. The mystery schools exist to recover and reassemble the lost knowledge of the Watchers, the dismembered body of Osiris. Initiates of the mysteries are embedded within the most powerful governing organizations in the world, but they stay hidden in the shadows of their secret societies. They are the Luciferian elite, the priests of power, pulling the strings from behind the thrones, guiding the hand of politicians and kings in order to catalyze the necessary geopolitical and metaphysical components, setting the stage for the arrival of the man they call their prince who is to come, but who we know as the son of perdition and the Antichrist. I believe he is coming in the clouds and will be hailed as our extraterrestrial savior. The Vatican is secretly preparing for the arrival of alien saviors. As crazy as that sounds, the exotheology is already being drafted. For several years now, Jesuit astronomers have been posturing themselves and their church for disclosure, speaking openly about life on other planets and the accommodation of extraterrestrials into Catholic doctrine, even declaring that if given the opportunity, they would eagerly baptize aliens. Welcome back to the world over. In May, Pope Francis set tongues a wagging when in a homily during his morning mass, he referenced a visit from extraterrestrials. The media ran with it and suggested that the Catholic Church was confirming the existence of intelligent life on other planets. Joining us tonight is a man who has literally pondered the mysteries of the heavens as part of his job. He is an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory and the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, a Jesuit and the co-author of the new book, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? We're delighted to have joining us Brother Guy Consol Magno in studio. Great, great to see you, brother. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Pope Francis, during right. one of his morning homilies, had this to say. I'll share it with the audience. He said, imagine if, for example, tomorrow an expedition of Martians came, green with long noses and big ears, just like children draw them, and were to say, I want to be baptized. What would happen. Here's the big question. Yeah. Would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Only if she asks. Okay. <laughs> Much of what is said in public by Vatican officials concerning aliens is tongue-in-cheek, facetious, as if their interest in extraterrestrials is more of a playful fancy than a serious consideration. But this is a very carefully calculated process of acclimation, like the proverbial boiling frog the masses are gradually being conditioned for disclosure without even realizing it. If you want to change somebody's worldview, you don't just come out of the gate with an argument that is diametrically opposed to everything they believe. You use the Fabian process of gradualism. You send out these little softballs like, well, if there was an alien intelligence, we would be willing to baptize them into the Catholic faith because after all, if they exist, they must be part of creation. So they're part of what God made. Little by little, they've changed that though and they've, and they've went to, to now saying, it's very possible that the alien intelligence is morally superior to us because what we know about ourselves is that we are fallen. 
but we can't assume the same thing about the aliens. Therefore, our space brothers may know more about God and the gospel than we do. Therefore, they will be coming here to baptize us into a better understanding of the Godhead. It won't be us baptizing them. So the language has continued to change. Eventually, they're going to claim that Jesus was an extraterrestrial and that life was seated on this planet by a superior race of beings thousands of years ago. And they may even produce documents and artifacts that have been locked away in their archives and vaults for centuries to prove their claim. We're talking about the greatest deception in history, and many Christians are going to fall for it because it will be so cunningly integrated into a biblical context and backed up with physical evidence. What we know is that right now, some of the Opus Dei level theologians at the Pontifical Academy in Rome, as well as the Pope's University in Rome, are uh, working on doctrine that very specifically has to do with religious information of an extraterrestrial source and what the impact of that might be uh, on faith on earth. For instance, Father Giuseppe Tanzelaniti is an Opus Dei level theologian. He works at the Pontifical University, the, the, the Pope's University in Rome. And here's what he says. He says that uh, if extraterrestrial intelligence provides information, it may cause us to have to rethink everything we have ever known and believed about the gospel. Here's a quote. He says, it would not immediately oblige the Christian to renounce his own faith in God simply on the basis of the reception of new unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations, but that such a renunciation could come soon after as the new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credible. Let me insert here, I have no idea how you would be able to confirm extraterrestrial information that's gonna alter the gospel. Uh, would be reasonable and acceptable, incredible. I don't know what, what that process is, but let me keep going. Uh, quote, once the trustworthiness of the information has been verified, the believer would have to reconcile such new information with the truth that he or she already knows and believes on the basis of the revelation of the one and triune God conducting a re-reading of the gospel inclusive of the new data. They seem to be preparing themselves uh, and not just, well, what if, maybe someday. I mean, they seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment, the official voice piece. Well, maybe these guys are talking about this uh, because of something that another Roman Catholic uh, priest had talked about, Monsignor Corrado Balducci. Corrado Balducci was an exorcist and theologian of the Vatican Curia and the foremost demonologist of the church. During the pontificate of Pope John Paul II, ironically, Balducci also became the official spokesperson on the subject of UFOs and aliens. Before he died, Corrado Balducci went on a series of Italian television programs talking about aliens, saying that they are real, that he had evidence that they are real. Furthermore, he said as an exorcist, he could confirm that they are not demons and they are not angels. He said they are advanced humanoid-like intelligences. But even more uh, outstanding was what happened just before he died. He came to the United States. He agreed to be part of a documentary film in which he said, not only is the Vatican aware of the alien intelligence, but there is an advanced guard of these aliens who are already here on Earth. And he said the Vatican is using their embassies from around the world both to study and survey the alien agenda, but also participating with them. What is little known about Balducci is that he had a very mysterious and close collaboration for many years with a man who is considered to be one of the founding fathers of the ancient astronaut theory, Zacharias Sitchin. 
Sitchin is most famous for his interpretation of ancient Mesopotamian texts and symbolism, especially as it relates to the Sumerians. He believed that mankind had been genetically engineered by a superior race of giant extraterrestrials called the Anunnaki in Sumerian legend. According to Sitchin's interpretations, the Anunnaki splice their own DNA with a primitive hominid species on Earth to create the human race. Sitchin further proposed that the Anunnaki had descended to the Earth from a rogue planet called Nibiru that follows an elliptical orbit in our solar system. He also contends that the Nephilim spoken about in the Bible, especially in Genesis 6, were in fact the Anunnaki. While in Rome, I had the opportunity to speak with one of the most knowledgeable Vatican researchers that I know, author Leo Zagami, who has been extremely accurate with predictions regarding the Holy See. We were joined by famous Italian entrepreneur and longtime personal friend of the late Zachariah Sitchin, Gian Mario Ferramonti. I was especially interested in Corrado Balducci's relationship with Zachariah Sitchin. They know each other very well. They were in touch by phone and by writings. Sometimes they exchange uh, strange documents in a box, and I was the one taking the box in New York and taking to the Vatican. What kind of documents were in this box? I could not open them, of course, and I never opened it, but I know they were interesting documents. What do you suspect? What is hiding by the Vatican? You know that uh, Vatican, uh, in the down part of the Vatican, there are thousands of everything. Artifacts. These are not really hidden in the archives. And let's not, uh, because people think, you know, the secret archives, uh, that's where the... That's a separate is. thing. It's a separate location. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you have, uh, let's say, you are well introduced in the Vatican, you can have eventually access to the secret archives. But you can never have access to the secret artifacts, which are kept in this big, huge uh, underground basement. So you're, there's more than just ancient texts beneath the Vatican. We're talking artifacts. Yes, yes. And do you believe that they have artifacts from the, from the past that would help, if they came to light, would help explain some of what's going on? Absolutely sure. And you think that this is what they, this is what Zachariah Sitchin was transferring back and forth with the demonologist? Uh, I can tell you what uh, Zechariah told me. We have been in touch for about 22, 23 years till he was dying five years ago, four years ago. And uh, he said that at the beginning, the Vatican was a kind of enemy to him because he was considered an enemy because he was a Jew and because uh, uh, he was telling something wrong uh, to the, the, the message to the humanity because if there is an alien God, where is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Is an alien too? Or who? What else? Mm -hmm. So, uh, after a while, they talked together many times. I was uh, in the house of Zechariah in New York, and I listened to uh, about one hour conversation by phone. And uh, I know that the Vatican, Mr. Balducci, changed his ideas about what Zechariah was saying, and uh, he was a fan of Zechariah at the end. It seems to me that the, that the Vatican is um, promoting, at this point, the, in some sense, the work of Zachariah Sitchin, uh, that, that they're almost preparing us to receive the aliens that are coming. Exactly. You got the point. They are preparing Earth for the encounter. But which is a controversial character. Now, I have made this series of books called Confessions of an Illuminati, mm -hmm. which I showed you the volume mm -hmm. one. I arrived to four volumes, and I, in volume three, I show an image which is very controversial. It shows Corrado Balducci, together with the chief Satanist of that time, which was called Ephraim del Gatto, together participating in a ritual exorcism. Now, how is possible that the Vatican chief demonologist is together with the chief Satanist Papa Neo, they used to call him in Rome, Ephraim del Gatto, and we actually have a photo that shows this collaboration between the Vatican and Satanists, I mean, it's, it, it's unheard right. of. But there is more to this. There is a satanic sect in the Vatican that operates since ancient times. There is a place called San Benedetto in Piscinibus, which is 
on the uh, near Borgo Santo Spirito, near where the Jesuits have the headquarters, a little bit before, there is this church. You can only see the, the rear part of the church. You can't ever get inside this church from outside. It's, it's kind of locked in between two buildings, so you can't really go into it if you're not in those buildings and you don't have the passages to actually go inside. Why? Because it's inside there that they do the most satanic rituals in the Vatican. So this is uh, the mysterious church of San Benedetto in Piscinibus, uh, where it's said uh, that they conduct uh, regularly satanic masses. As you see, this church uh, is not really, doesn't really have an official entrance or anything. It's closed in between two big buildings and it's right, the core of Vatican Satanism is right there. But uh, is this uh, Satanism or is this ancient paganism? Because uh, we are talking here about ancient artifacts that predate Christianity. And uh, these beliefs uh, were not really cast out of Rome once the Vatican established itself. The they were co-opted into they, they were co-opted in, you know, like for example, the 25th of December after, you know, the establishment of Christianity in the empire, they took uh, basically the Mitra cult headquarters and transformed it in what is now the Vatican. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they did that also with other religions. And some of the religions in the empire were bloodthirsty, blood, uh, blood cults. Basically, you have to, like Moloch, bring them a, a, a ch child, bring them a virgin. They were really bloodthirsty gods. And those cults never really went away. They simply went underground. So uh, we have all this link going on uh, in regards to the fact that Corrado Balducci, for some reason, he wanted to be also involved with Satanist link directly. And I, the terms of this connection is for me really puzzling. I mean, what do you think about this connection? It's interesting to understand uh, when you talk about Satanism, what is Satanism? Who is Satan? Is the same person with uh, Lucifer or what? So this is the real question to understand. Uh, the idea of uh, Zechariah, we have been talking a long time about this, was that Lucifer is one of these Anunnaki running this planet. In a person, in personality, mm -hmm. this is an alive being mm -hmm. living for thousands of years and he lives inside earth and he, he uh, Sitch, Sitchin was completely sure that there are cities underground where these people this uh, extraterrestrial lives in many ways, Zachariah Sitchin was very close to the truth, but he was interpreting and advocating a perverted version of prehistory written by a culture that was in open rebellion against God, even while the sons of Noah were still alive. Sumer is synonymous with Nimrod and Babylon. It was a kingdom that Nimrod founded in the plains of Shinar. Nimrod's name means the rebel because it was he that led the inhabitants of the earth into rebellion and idolatry after the flood. The records of the Sumerians represent a biased recounting of pre-flood history told from a rebel's point of view. In the Sumerian account, the fallen watchers are called the Anunnaki and are seen as benevolent beings that genetically improved the human race and taught mankind the arts of civilization. The God of the Bible who sent the flood is characterized in the Epic of Gilgamesh as a grotesque monster and is despised. Nimrod is depicted as a mighty hero and the offspring of the gods. Even Lucifer is styled in regal form as Enki, the leader of the gods, the lord of the earth, and the master of the Abzu, the abyss. Enki is credited with the creation of the human race and with saving humanity from the flood. His symbol was a snake, and he was known as the wisest of all beings. The ultimate act of rebellion by the Sumerians was the construction of the Tower of Babel. It was a boast of defiance against the Lord who had sent the flood and destroyed the old world. 
Nimrod and his descendants knew that God had made a covenant with their father Noah, promising not to destroy the world in a flood again. So they mocked him and provoked him by worshiping the fallen angels, committing unbridled sin, and building a tower high enough to withstand another flood, daring God to break his word. But there was more to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel than rebellion and scorn. The Bible says that Nimrod began to be a Gabor, a mighty one in the earth. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament used by the apostles and the early church, the same verse literally states that Nimrod began to be a giant. Nimrod's apparent and mysterious transformation into a Gabor, a hybrid giant, was immediately followed by the building of the first empire. It is plausible that Nimrod was actually attempting to rebuild the desolated ruins of pre-flood cities in the plains of Shinar. One of the cities he built was called Babel or Babylon, meaning gate of the gods, which would become the location of the infamous Tower of Babel. You get the impression that not only was Nimrod a tyrant and a rebel, he was also engaging in some kind of sorcery involving the opening of metaphysical gates. The Sumerian cylinder seals depict the god Enki emerging through a gate or portal from the Abzu, the abyss. The Sumerians constructed a temple over this metaphysical gateway called the A Abzu, which was never completed. Some archaeologists suggest that the A Abzu was in fact the foundation of the Tower of Babel, or the Tower of the Gate of the Gods. Nimrod's genetic transformation and sudden impulse to build the Tower of Babel seems to correspond with the recovery of pre-flood knowledge represented by Oannes, the fish man who emerged out of the sea. The half-man, half-fish appearance of Oannes is probably symbolic of preserved knowledge from the antediluvian world since only creatures of the sea survived the flood. This may be an indication that Nimrod had somehow made contact with demonic entities and recovered some of the knowledge relating to the sorcery and science of genetic manipulation and the opening of dimensional gates. Both the records of the Sumerians and the biblical account, together with other ancient apocryphal texts, suggest that Nimrod was attempting to bring about the recurrence and restoration of the empire of the gods that was destroyed in the waters of the flood. But something amazing happened. God himself intervened to stop Nimrod from accomplishing his plan and confuse the language of the people so that they could no longer continue their work. By confusing the language of the people, not only did God put a stop to the sorceress activity in which they were engaged, he also ensured that the illicit knowledge of the Watchers they had apparently recovered was partitioned among the various groups of people that could no longer communicate with one another. This knowledge is now compartmentalized and preserved only in part by various occult mystery school factions all over the earth. The mythology inscribed on the tablets and cylinder seals of the Sumerians was devised by the first civilization to emerge in the world after the flood of Noah, a civilization following in the rebellion of Nimrod and the fallen angels. It was in the plains of Shinar that the seeds of idolatry and sorcery were sown in every culture. When the people were separated at the Tower of Babel, they eventually spread out over the whole face of the earth, each group carrying with them artifacts from Sumer and fragments of knowledge concerning the world before the flood of Noah. Over time, only the most fundamental elements of pre-flood history remained in each culture, such as the gods descending from heaven, giants a great flood, and the premonition that someday the gods would return and their empire would be restored. But a true and accurate record was preserved by God through the descendants of Jacob, the story of creation, the fall of man, the descent and corruption of the watchers, the great flood of Noah, 
and most importantly, the incredible plan for the redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of God's own beloved Son, Jesus, were all preserved in the text of Scripture. I believe that Zechariah Sitchin was a sincere man who rightly rejected the ludicrous theory of human origins proffered by Darwinists, but imprudently also rejected the true narrative of Scripture in favor of the Sumerian account written from the perspective of fallen rebels. Sitchin wasn't just developing a new theory for the origin of man, he was rekindling a very ancient deception, a deception associated with extremely guileful entities that are still active in the world today and anxious for the opportunity to manifest themselves again and guide mankind toward another tower of Babel scenario. I would like to tell you more about Zechariah Sitchin, something that he never wrote in any book, something happening to him personally. He was about three years before he was dead. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up at 12 o'clock and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. And this alien looked at me and said, Zechariah, go immediately to the hospital because your heart is going to leave you. And he asked me, what would you do? And I said, go to the hospital immediately. He went to the hospital the same night he was operated at the heart. And they told him that he would never survive that night if he was not going to be in the hospital at night. He never wrote this in any book, but he told me, and I can tell you now. In the alien world, which is another level, extra-dimensional, not like perceived by the common ufologist, but by the esoteric person who has knowledge, they have orders. Orders meaning that they belong, these aliens, some of them belong to, to orders, specific orders that they follow, you know, a specific entity. They are devoted to him. Even in, so it's not a question only of humans following some god, but it's also these entities following their own, you know, chief in command. So our perception is always wrong because we tend to simplify things. To, uh, mat uh, to, to make it too materialistic. Many ufologists, uh, for example, they lose the bigger picture because either they take one truth, which is very pragmatic, meaning, okay, there is the alien, he abducted, brought me on the spaceship, blah, blah, blah. Then, instead, uh, you should have a different kind of perception. You should say, but is that really what happened? Why in the Middle East nobody's ever been abducted? But they actually tell you about being abducted by gene in their own world for thousands of years. So the, the, it's speaking just a different language in different terms, but this reality exists. Mm -hmm. So in the Vatican, these things are known. And what the Jesuits have done, and he knows very well in the last two decades, is been to open up to this reality and with this organization called CIFAS. We've organized two big conferences in the Vatican about the subject of the UFOs. But here we're not talking about conferences with the average ufologist, new agey, you know, dressed up in white, uh, being there in, in Arizona watching the skies. Here we're talking about military people. We're talking about military, about politicians, about cardinals. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine that they have secrets under the Vatican and that are, are, are buried there that could really change the course of history. Let me just uh, say one more thing. The Vatican invested an awful amount of money in telescopes. You know that? You know why? They are looking for Nibiru. They want to know one day before anybody else when Nibiru is coming to say the planet of the Saviors is coming and they want to put their flag on it. In the early 1990s, a bitter conflict was brewing for the control of a mountain in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. The mountain was Mount Graham, and the conflicting parties were the San Carlos Apache Indians and an international consortium of astronomers led by the Vatican. 
Mount Graham has always been sacred to the Apache. It's mentioned in many of their songs and oral traditions and is believed to be the abode of powerful spiritual beings. In 1984, the Vatican, together with the University of Arizona, chose Mount Graham as a site on which to build several state-of-the-art telescopes, including the Large Binocular Telescope, the largest and most advanced telescope in the world, which would be fitted with a specialized device strategically named Lucifer. The Lucifer device enables observations to be made in the near-infrared wavelength range and can penetrate through dust clouds deep into the far reaches of outer space. The Vatican was very aggressive in its move to secure Mount Graham for their observatory. Representatives of the Apache tribe pleaded with the consortium to choose another mountain, but their protests fell on deaf ears. Legislation for the approval of the project was pushed through governmental channels, and the Apache were pushed aside. During an interview in 1997, radio host Art Bell asked the former Jesuit priest Malachi Martin about why the Vatican had muscled its way onto Mount Graham and what it was they were looking for in deep space. Malachi Martin's response ignited a firestorm of speculation. All right, um, Father, uh, the, the Vatican has a very, very great deal of power. That's right. um, we've talked about it. Uh, they have, uh, whether they admit it or not, a great deal of political power mm -hmm. all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they did fairly recently was they muscled, and I, I do intend to use that word, sure. uh, they muscled their way onto a mountain in Arizona, Mount Graham, mm -hmm. and they built an observatory on Mount Graham mm -hmm. in connection with an Arizona university. Yeah. However, the Vatican has the larger part of the control of this observatory, yeah. looking at deep space things. That's right. Now, why would they have done that, Father? Because the, mental, the attitude, the mentality amongst uh, those who, at the higher level, the highest levels, of Vatican administration and Vatican geopolitics know that uh, now knowledge of what's going on in space and what's approaching us could be of great import in the next uh, five years, ten years. Carefully and well chosen words, Father. Thank you. This guy was no Johnny come lately. Malachi Martin worked under three popes, was favored by them. He was a formidable polyglot. He could speak 17 languages and he could translate most extinct languages. He was the first guy that broke the news about how hundreds of young boys were being molested by what he called Luciferians, uh, satanic priests, uh, that he said reached all the way to the highest levels of, of the Vatican among the College of Cardinals. And at the time, you know, Jesuits and others were saying he's a chronic liar, he's making all this stuff up. Well, history proves that he was actually telling the truth. What was he right about with regards to Mount Graham? In 2009, the Vatican abruptly called an astrobiology study week. But what was the subject matter? If you go back and Google this and read, they really only had one objective. They brought in 30 of the world's top astronomers, they brought in theologians to ask one question. What will the impact on faith, on religion be, given the disclosure or the discovery of advanced extraterrestrial intelligence? 90 days later, the Royal Academy. Now this is the oldest scientific body in the world. They convene, call all of the scientists from around the world, including astronomers from the Vatican, and what do they want to talk about? Exactly the same thing, the detection of extraterrestrial intelligence and the impact on society. Well, we were wanting to get to the bottom of all of that. Why are they saying the things that they're saying? And so Chris Putnam and I decided that the only way that we could know for sure was we had to go to the Jesuits. 
ourselves. We had to go to their astronomers, and specifically, if any way possible, we had to go to the top of Mount Graham. And this is the headquarters of the Jesuit order. This is the Rome. entrance of the Jesuit quarters for the world. For so, the world. Here the general lives. The black so here hole. this is where the general yeah. resides, is here in this, in this building. This building. It's like, uh, you, you know, I mean, very important building. I mean, not very known uh, touristically, not very known touristically, actually, no, absolutely not known touristically, but inside here, the most important interreligious affairs are conducted at a worldwide level. So, while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about, again, about Mount Graham. Mount Graham was a holy site for the Indians, for the American Indians. So, the link there is both at a um, scientific level, at an esoteric, magical, I mean, it's a, it's a gate, it's an interdimensional gate. There's, there's a gate on Mount Graham. This is what he said, but at the same and you time... you think they, they have interest in, in controlling that gate or activating that gate? At the same time, they have also interest in watching the stars above. Like I told you earlier uh, on in, in the other part of the interview we did together, um, they have uh, the knowledge that uh, everything that is below is reflected above, and so they want to exactly see when these prophecies manifest how there is certain, let's say, center conjunctions in the stars that need to be monitored and interpreted, not like a scientist will, a classic scientist, but a scientist with a holy knowledge. Holy, uh, holy knowledge, mm -hmm. you know? And they give a lot of importance to ancient cultures and their holy sites, because they know that those holy sites are built on uh, uh, ways for, you understand? So there is, uh, let's say, a mix of traditional science and esoteric science in this choice. And we can also say that what they're doing there is very important for them because those watchers who are contact with those American Indians left a trail of their existence there and left some knowledge and of course also now they can feed on, on it by being there. They, if, you see, when the Americans, uh, the American Indians uh, were decimated, the Jesuits were always there. They went into hearing the history of these various uh, groups, finding out the different historical aspects, finding out if, uh, what kind of contacts they had with the world. So then they said, okay, this tribe has a privileged contact. Where is their base? Where is their most holy ground? Okay, tak. We get to the top of the mountain. We went first to the Vatican's Advanced Technology Telescope. Uh, we met with the Jesuit who was on duty. We asked him about Malachi Martin. We asked him about Corrado Balducci. We asked him why uh, Jose Funes was out there saying we would baptize aliens. We have all of this on film. And some of his answers were astonishing. But the one that I found to be uh, the most intriguing was when he told us that the Vatican now only uses the advanced telescope for one purpose, one. He said, and that is to monitor exo-worlds on which they believe the conditions exist for extraterrestrial life. Now that might have been a real tell about what it is they're watching on the top of that mountain that they think might be approaching the earth as Malachi Martin said. So we spend the morning there. Um, but we also had a second agenda while we were there because the Vatican's uh, Advanced Technology Telescope is only one of three telescopes. They also use the apparatus that is inside what's called the Large Binocular Telescope, which is the largest telescope in the world, and it's on the top of Mount Graham. Uh, so we left the VAT. Uh, we walked up to the top of the mountain where exists the Large Binocular Telescope, and that place was buzzing. And there were people everywhere in the building. There were a whole team of German astronomers who were there making adjustments to the telescope. 
there's a point where we're up, I think we're up seven stories or something. Uh, and now we're looking down onto the top of the giant twin mirrors. And you see me and Chris standing there and the engineer standing there with a laser pointer. And he points down to the middle of the twin mirrors where there's a large red device down in there. And you hear him saying, this is the Lucifer device. And that's exactly what they call it. In fact, they lovingly call it Lucy. And they are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Now, they would not allow us to see what the Lucifer device was watching, but we were told that it was very specifically monitoring something in deep space. They were very uh, cryptic about it. Again, seemed to be echoing what Malachi Martin had said, that they were watching a specific something that is approaching uh, the Earth. We were also astonished that day when we went inside the control room and here's all these banks of monitors with images of deep space and as the engineer is talking about the Lucifer device and deep space and all that he just blurts out something that we didn't even ask and he starts talking about how sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way so that they could look at other things in space and we were astonished by that because we had intended not to even ask that question, but without asking, what the engineer is telling us is that it was so crowded with essentially an armada of UFOs that they had to literally sit there for hours waiting for these UFOs to move out of the way in very deep space so that this guy could focus on this one part of this exo world. And we have a lot of this on film. He's just telling us this stuff. So we were, we were really astonished how it's almost like yawn another UFO. And they're not talking about space debris and asteroids. They're talking about what appear to be intelligently uh, operated craft of some type that evidently fill deep space. When we came down off the mountain, I was immediately contacted by a member of the Apache Nation. He emailed me and he wanted me to know that the reason that the Apache did not want the Vatican and NASA and ASU on the top of Mount Graham was because Mount Graham is for them one of the four holiest mountains in all of the world. And it is for all indigenous Americans. Uh, and it is because he said in your language, he said you would call this a stargate a portal, a doorway, a strategic geographic location where he said entities have entered into and exited from our three-dimensional reality since the dawn of time. Well, I got to tell you, when he said that, the conspiracy meter in my head went off the Richter scale, right? When I started thinking now about why that mountain and the Vatican, because the Vatican has shown around the world Wherever these esoteric places are discovered, wherever metaphysical phenomenon seems to be predominant, wherever these ancient and even megalithic structures are found, they will move in, take over the land, if at all possible, build facilities and churches and whatever in those very locations so that they can maintain a constant presence where these doorways, these portals have been found. Believe it or not, stargates, portals, interdimensional doorways that open into supernatural realms are real. The discovery and control of the specific locations on Earth where these gates exist is one of the most classified deep black operations conducted by military and intelligence organizations around the world. The sorcery associated with accessing and opening these gates was the most dangerous and destructive knowledge given to mankind by fallen angels. Legends of gateways and portals opening to both heavenly and hellish realms frequently appear in the tablets, scrolls, and scripts of the ancient world, including both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. We wanted to examine whether or not it is a biblical premise that there are specific locations on the earth where there are gateways or doorways, vortexes, that connect supernaturalism with the physical world. And once we started looking at whether or not that is biblical, it was amazing how it just kind of opened up in the scripture. And now we started seeing everywhere, right? Genesis 28, 
Jacob has a vision and he sees, now in the King James Version of the Bible, it's called a ladder. But the Hebrew there is very interesting in that it seems to describe a spiral. So was it like a spiral staircase? That's what some people have suggested, but others have said a vortex, which happens to be kind of an international symbol that you find across all cultural barriers as a symbol of a vortex, right? But in any case, Jacob sees angels ascending and descending from heaven. He comes out of that vision. He is so shook up because this is so vivid that he gets out anointing oil. He's trembling, right? And he anoints the entire place, but he says something very important. Now, a lot of people say that he said, this is the house of God. But if you read that in the Hebrew, that's not what he says. He says, there is a gate here to the house of God. There is a gateway, a doorway here. Well, we found that once you started thinking about that concept, it spanned from the Old Testament through the New Testament. Jesus arrives, he's talking about the windows of heaven and how from henceforth you'll see the windows of heaven open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It's an Old and New Testament principle. Now we also found that like the Apache Indian have done, the scripture often combines the location of these gateways to mountainous regions. Remember how Moses, whenever he's going to meet with God, he has to go to the top of the Mount Sinai. Look at how when Jesus returns, it says his feet will touch the top of the Mount of Olives, and then he will descend down to the earth. In the apocryphal book of Enoch, it talks about the 200 watchers that descended in the days of Jared, but how do they come down? They come down from the top of Mount Hermon, down into the valley of the plains, and then they begin their illegal activity. Jesus later, years later, is standing at the base of Mount Hermon. He is standing there with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, and that's the location where the Greeks, by that time, had built mystical doorways into the base of that mountain, and actually in commemoration of the legends that dated back to the watchers descending on that mountain. And it's there where Jesus is standing with his disciples, and he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. In the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, a star falls from heaven to the earth. He is given the key to the bottomless pit. When he opens the abyss, a great smoke arises and all hell breaks loose. And up out of this gateway of the earth come these terrible insectoids that begin tormenting unrighteous humanity, right, that's on the, on the face of the earth. Many people, though, don't know that there's something very intriguing in that same chapter, chapter 9 of uh, Revelation, ends by saying something extraordinary. It says that those people who are being tortured by these insectoids, these transgenic beings that come up out of the underworld, who have a king over them called Abaddon or Apollyon, it says, and yet they repented not of their sorceries. And the a Greek word there, sorcery, is pharmakia. Now what is pharmakia? In the biblical context, and the reason it was forbidden, a pharmakia is the use of technology and sorcery for the express purpose of opening a doorway which God has closed in order to put ourselves in contact with what is behind it. It's the use of sorcery to open metaphysical doorways, gateways. So imagine this, that in Revelation 9, where the gates of the earth open and these terrible things come up and start torching humanity, it ends by saying, and yet they repented not of their pharmakia, of their effort to open doorways to the metaphysical world. So it's almost as if God is saying, you asked for it, you got it. We are approaching another Tower of Babel moment on the earth. Another Nimrod is arising. The rebellion and sorcery of the Sumerians is reigniting in the hearts of men. Soon, forbidden gates will be opened and the man of sin will appear. Even now, theological foundations are being laid in anticipation of the arrival of a superior alien race. 
the fishhead priests of Babylon are preparing to fulfill their occult destiny and welcome from heaven the return of the gods. Those who control the past determine the future. The reality of the pre-flood age has been concealed, covered over and covered up so that the truth of prehistory will remain forgotten and the world will be doomed to repeat it. God said that his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The great deception of the future will take advantage of the ignorance of the past. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. For thousands of years, Luciferians have been envisioning the time in which we now live. The consummation of their ancient plan is finally drawing near. The lost knowledge of the Watchers has been recovered. Like Osiris, the Golden Age will be resurrected and fallen angels will lead mankind in one last insurrection. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning, and men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. Several years after my uh, deployments to Afghanistan, something very strange happened to me um, that is somewhat related to this. I was uh, basically TDY to Kirtland Air Force Base, which is out in Albuquerque. Uh, I was out with my JAG at the time, and there was a uh, Navajo Native American uh, sitting basically in the restaurant that we're in. It was also a bar. It was actually Kelly's, uh, Kelly's Brew Pub. And uh, this Native American guy, out of nowhere, he was talking to us, very friendly guy. And out of nowhere, he asked me if I knew what a Native American sing was. And um, no, I didn't at the time. I do now because I looked it up. But uh, he says, I, I have to sing for you. And he put his hand on me and started a Native American prayer, if you will. And I thought, wow, this is very strange. Uh, but it was cool as well. My, my uh, jag that I was with actually took out her, uh, her apple uh, iPhone and started to film it and he stopped and said no no not on film not on film and he she put it away and he sang the prayer and here's where it gets very strange he started talking about did I know that there were giants out in the Sandia mountains and he said they're out there in the mountains still and the earth had swallowed them up and he goes watch out he says someday they're gonna come back they're gonna come back I then uh, took him aside and said hey as a matter of fact I've seen these things they're real I at least I think I've seen these things uh, and I basically conveyed to him the story. He just took it in stride and said, yes, they're real. They're absolutely real. And he said something like, if I remember correctly, like the earth had swallowed them up, but soon the earth will spit them back out. And soon, he said, soon, they're coming back.